You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. And we got a really cool guest um, on the show. And without further ado, why don't I just bring him in? Travis, how are you doing today, bud? Hey. Dude, I just I just want to say thank you so much for uh, for coming on the show last minute. A um, lot to catch up on in your life. Uh, I, I guess we should just kind of start with the thing that probably everyone wants to know about that follow you about about your tournaments. So I'll just let you take it from here. Whichever tournament you want to start with, the State of the Union on how you think that everything's gone. Well, hey, we can start with the first Elite Seventies back in March on Smith okay. Mountain. Um, that was a cold event. To begin with, and then we, we hit it perfect. We hit it right on a warming. Uh, the weird thing, warming trend, and then the day of the event at noon, it started. That morning was cold. There was not that bad though. It got colder throughout the day. Oof. Uh, uh, but no, it was it was it was good. Um, was just finding fish. Fish a lot. How- how many days did you get to pre-fish it? Um, I was down there the weekend before that uh, for two other style events. Um, and then the that Friday, my partner practiced. I wasn't able to off work to go down there and practice. Okay. Nope, sorry, just breaking up there a little bit. Perfect. All right, sorry. Um, no, 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 it's not. Oh, did we just lose him? Nope, there he is. Okay, yeah. So, so, you, so you get there. Uh, you get there day one uh, of the Elite Seventies event. It's a little bit colder than usual in March. Were they what? What part of the pre-spawn do you think they were in? Um, that very last stage because they were trying to be on the beds. What were your, what were your thoughts like getting into day one? Did you feel like you pretty much had them figured out, or was it going to be kind of just a fly by the seat of your pants? Um. We definitely had an area of the lake that was, seemed to be better than the rest. So we kind of had them figured out in that section of the lake. And about 11 o'clock, we went in there. And by 1.30, we had 17 and a half, 17 and a quarter or something like that. Damn. So it was, um, you know, we ended up getting, I believe, 11th or 12th in that event. 20-something 20, 20 pounds won it. Um, but the weights were really tight. Let's be honest. Um, you know, we if we would have had a kicker, we never had a kicker. I think our biggest fish was four pounds. That's a pretty solid limit for seventeen pounds, though, with not having like a major kicker. Yes, especially at Smith that time of year, because that time of year at Smith, you better have a seven plus if you're gonna weigh in anything substantial. Is there? Let me try to phrase this question. Does Lake Anna, because that's where your home water is, does that translate a lot to Smith, or is it like completely different? The fundamentals. Um, it has its similarities, but Smith is just such a variety. Like you can do a lot more things at Smith. It definitely has the similarities with like fishing shallow. Like, you know, you got docks with rock, docks of wood. Um, you don't really have like willow grass or anything around the shorelines, but you got a lot of rat bank, you Mm -hmm. know, second points, you know, stuff like that, that you could kind of tie the two in together. Okay. And then w- when you went into this and then versus w- when you got out of it, w- did you have the same kind of strategy when it came to baits or did you guys have to change a lot on the fly? Um, really? I think I threw one rod all day. Oh, damn. Okay. Yeah. You were locked. In. <laughs> um, if I didn't throw one rod all day, I might've thrown two. Maybe. Oh my God. Um, same with my partner. He threw, I know he threw two rods, um, all day pretty much. And that was it. That's freaking, that's awesome. I wish I had more days like that on the water. Oh, so, yeah. It's nice having a pattern that's that dialed in. So if you want to, you know, like, what, what did you catch him on for that event? And then kind of like give yourself a grade on that. Because I'm thinking 17 pounds. That's pretty damn good. Um, that's got to put you in the in the upper like 30% of the field, right? Uh, we got a check. We finished yeah. uh, 10th, 11th or 12th, somewhere around in there. I think okay. it was 10th. I think it was 10th. Dude, yeah, that's a real, that's a damn good way to start the year. No, it was it was definitely a very good start to the year. Um, I mean, we had a morning deal, caught them on 
offshore Carolina rigging, you know, simple, easy. Mm-hmm. I like doing kind of stuff like that. But, uh, and then the after 11 o'clock deal really was just go run a bunch of docks. Okay. I was throwing a shaky head. My partner was throwing a jig. I mean, you can't get much more simple than that. Yeah. But it's honestly keeping it simple though, is honestly sometimes the best thing. Cause I see so many guys get spun out and we've interviewed them where you do have that spin out phase where you just try to go into your box and start picking anything and throwing it against the wall. And sometimes having too much tackle can really hurt, hurt you. Oh yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong about two o'clock. I think we were doing that at that point, just because we were looking for a five, six, seven pounder. So we were kind of throwing the whole sink at them, but it just never panned out. Did you ever try big swim baits there? Cause I've heard like, I remember the skeet Reese thing. I've tried Ospreys there before and it's hit or miss. I was throwing it there that afternoon, but I never had a, yeah. I'm, I'm not, there's guys I know that are very good at it over there and they have tried to show me how to throw that big swim bait and I can't ever catch them on it. So I just, I try it. You never know that one cast, you never know it'd be a seven, eight pounder. So mm-hmm. I'll try it when it, I feel it's time to try it, but I'm yet to even succeed on it. So. So w- with the end of the Smith mountain tournament, you've got to be feeling really good about how you start out the year. What, what was the next event that you had on your schedule? Um, on my schedule, the, or, well, yeah, the next one was the Elite Seventies at um, Lake Gaston. Uh, okay. Ninth. I know that one was April 9th. And then, so going into that one, you already you already cashed one check, and you have a lot of history on gas, and even from our last interview. So, like, were, were you just were you running history? Did you actually get get a chance to pre fish that? Yeah, we pre fished it. Um, and yeah, it was mainly running history. I we I know. We started on like a shad deal, like a herring deal down there uh, for spots, like just like we did last year in the championship. And we caught fish. They just, they weren't the right quality. Um, then we went to the plan B, which is sticking with what we do best. And we fished shallow and covered a lot of docks. Uh, we ended up with 1483. And I think we got 18th in that event. That's not bad. Damn, dude. <laughs> You haven't dipped below the 20th in the first two events. That's pretty good. That's a hell of a start to the year. Yeah, no, it's it's not bad. Don't get me wrong. Uh, There was, I I broke one fish off. I wish I could have got back in that event. That. But how much would have actually helped though? How much, how many spots do you think you would have jumped with that? Um, Well, we had 1483 for, like I said, I think 18th and I'm pretty sure 17 pounds was top five. Okay. So that fish would have put us right around that 17 pound mark. Damn. Were the yeah. blue were the, was the blueback bite a, a main contributor to that event? No. No, it, it it was just getting started. It it was something if you found it, you could catch a few solid fish off of possibly. Um and it didn't I mean, we had one buttoned up first, uh, I don't know, it might have been third cast that morning that we never got to see. Couldn't tell you if it was a striper, couldn't tell you if it was a big spot. Mm-hmm. Um but it definitely, it pulled off. It was big, whatever it was, because it was stripping jag on the jerk bait. Damn. Yeah. Yeah, so that was either the winner or it was a striper. That's that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it, it was it was a good event, though. I mean, all in all, we, we stuck to a game plan, ran it, and came out with a good finish, good points for, you know, continuing the year. Yeah, so at this point, where are you in the point standing off the top of your head for, for the Elite? Um, after the third event on Anna, I think I was just told we're in 11th. Holy shit. So I guess that brings us to our next one. So then you, you haven't, you haven't dipped below 20th place yet to start the year. So that's a pretty good start. And now you go to Lake Anna next. Yeah. Lake Anna next. That was, uh, April 23rd. And if you give me two seconds, I'll tell you exactly what we finished in that one. Yep. You go for it. And then guys, uh, in the comment section below, yeah, if you want to ask Travis any questions, we will have a Q&A, a quick Q&A at, at the end of this. Uh, just just type your questions in to ask Travis anything you'd like to. Um, if you'd also like to support this guy, uh, please go over to his social medias. That will be linked in the episode description below. If you missed the live stream, don't worry. This will be dropping as a podcast episode next Tuesday morning. Yeah, there's the points. Um, yep, 11th in the points. And that event we finished with, I know, 1183. Not 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 great weights, 
um, there is some fish in that one that definitely costed costed us big time. Let's go with that. I had one that I seen while I was uh, we were cruising down the bank. Every bit of four, four and a, four and a half pounds, and um, my buddy, my partner goes, "Man, you ain't gonna catch that fish." And I make one pitch over there, shake it a couple times, and next thing you know. Okay, there it is. Um, and next thing you know, fish bit it, started swimming off, and oh that's like the hook. I, I kind of cranked into it a little too hard with that light line. Oh, geez. He swam. He was swinging for the fence. So, so then, with that Lake Anna event, I mean, I, I want I want to kind of get into like your your approach to that event because that's that's your home water. And I I've always been curious when you hear with the with the big time pros about the home field advantage versus the home field curse. I mean, going into it, did you think that was going to be your best event of, oh, of the no three tournaments? Okay. It was either Gaston or that one. Okay. Yeah. Cause like it, it's, so then going into it with, with the weights, the way they were, how did you think the fish were going to set up that time of year? Oh, I definitely felt like I would have frag garters, spawners, and some pre-spawn coming in. Okay. With how, I truly like to fish that uh, that body of water. Because, like, with the lake being the size it is, and this has always been fascinating to me, because I heard Thrift talk about this once, where if at this time of year, if you got to go straight to the high percentage stuff immediately just because you might not be able to get it in a first rotation, were you guys specifically targeting, like, spawners first and then kind of segueing to, to certain locations? Or... No. Okay. Um... Our main goal in practice was finding fish feeding for the morning time, getting on that herring deal, seeing if it was running, and it was there. Um, we Where we started at was, yes, we wanted to be the first ones there. So we got there. We were first. Um, start throwing top water. Next thing you know, we have them jumping over our bait but not getting it. Good ones, too. Real good quality fish. Um, and then we caught a few stripers and we we're like, man, maybe the stripers are starting to move in. And we caught one or two little keepers and we left. Um, cause then we felt it was time to get on the covering a lot of water looking for, we, we had fish that were marked, you know, and we just pulled up and just kind of made a long cast to it. And, uh, just caught a bunch of the bucks, didn't really get the females to bite. So. Then we go to plan C where you just covering a lot of water, really just cover a lot of water and keep your eyes peeled. And mm -hmm. I, I truly love fishing that way. Um, most of the time, these type of tournaments, I won't even go mark any fish on beds uh, unless it's over eight pounds type deal. So how much time would you put in pre-tournament for that, that type of strategy? Um, depending on how many days you get before the event, really. Okay. Um, with the elite seventies, you have an off limits from the weekend before until the Friday, right before the day of the tournament. Um, so you really only get one day in this time of year. You only get one day to look at them and practice that way. So that weekend before you, you try to go out and find that other stuff, you know, figure out where they're moving to, where they're at on the lake, what they're doing. And then that Friday before you just go to the area with knowledge of Lake Anna that, you know, like, me fishing it for years i know areas where bigger ones spawn mm -hmm. so does my partner my partner lives on the lake for christ's sakes um and that's how we practice it that one day we went looking okay looking for giants and never found really they didn't get on the beds like we expected so um it, it came it, it boiled down to just running water and covering water and then we ended up catching I think uh, I caught a four and a three pounder up shallow on some stuff we knew about. And that was pretty much the day we just never, I broke one fish off that I saw that was probably four pounds. And I lost another one underneath the dock that felt right. I, I couldn't tell you. Mm. And then, so with the one under the dock, did you break that one off too? Or did nope. you just pull off? Just I just pulled them off. I mean, it's, it sounds like even with the tournament, you guys had to come out with 11th place. That's freaking awesome. And, and well, 11 pounds, we came out 22nd place in the tournament, gave us 11th place in the points. 
with 11 pounds. So what, wait, what were the weights above you then for 11 pounds at Lake Anna? Was it, uh, was it a high drop off? No, not at all. Actually it was, I'll tell you first place was 2251. Okay. And then there was fifth place and up was over, you know, 17 pounds or over. And to get the last place check, you had to have 1293. 1293. Wow. Okay. It gave you 12th, 13th place. That's wow. So one big bite. This actually is a, I don't know if you can see this. We got actually a good question here. Uh, Casey Foreman asks, what's your strategy moving into Lake Anna, especially with the wacky weather? Um, that is actually, I'm going to, add to that question do you think the fish are are ahead or behind because of how bipolar this weather has been um i think you have a i don't know what a good fraction of it would be but i think you you don't have quite a i think it's a little bit over a quarter of the population have already done their deal and it's gone okay but I think this next wave you'll see that comes up to do their deal because of the wacky weather will be pretty much the rest of the entire lake. And then you'll have a, a few stragglers later, you know, in some later months. Unlike before, usually you get your first wave, your big wave, and then a third wave that's pretty solid still. I don't think you're going to have that solid third wave because mm -hmm. of the weather. I think once this weather stabilizes, based off water temperatures I've seen all over the state, um, and the moon phases we've had this next wave. It's just, they're ready to do it. They just haven't. Mm -hmm. That's what, yeah. It's just, it's so weird, especially looking at the weights at, at the James and everything. And also the weights of the Potomac river. I, I do feel like there are, it has really affected them. And I think it's affected the grass, honestly, at the Potomac river too, in certain areas. Cause that's been really weird. I, I've heard that. And I've heard there's areas that's just phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, and it's like Belmont Bay is looking pretty good right now. Matter Woman's a little bit weird, and it's like where it was last year. In some places, it's, it's not there anymore, or it's not as it hasn't grown up as much. And I really wonder if it's the winter we had that really caused that. I'm, you know, I really, yeah. could, you know, I ain't been to the Potomac to look at it. I know I've heard that we didn't have a cold enough winter this past winter to really kill off some of the main areas of grass, so the grass grew different this year. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm definitely trying to get up there though here soon and go snakehead fishing. I know it's like, it's starting to explode, explode. <laughs> but I mean, so, so anyway, cause as I pull us off track like that, so we get through these three tournaments, what's the next one? Well, what, I didn't actually answer that gentleman's question. He said something about wacky weather. What was it? Yeah. What's your strategy moving into Lake Ann, especially with the wacky weather happening? Okay. So yeah, we answered it for the most part. But for strategy purposes, I I would just cover a lot of water. When you got wacky weather like we're having, the fish can be anywhere. Just cover a lot of water. And especially like if especially this time of year. And then of course we got Kenny saying about two weeks behind. Ken Presley saying about two yeah. weeks behind. Yeah, roughly. And then we get those. And as questions come in, I guys, as questions come in, I will make sure I, I shuffle them to, to Travis here. Um, but then, uh, let's see. Yeah. So then, yeah, we're, we're three tournaments in. you're doing phenomenal. You're at, I mean, hell dude, like you're doing great in the points. I mean, I think you should be riding high at this point. Um, yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm happy, but it's not my standards. It's not where I want to be at. So I'm a little bit disappointed. Well, where did you want to be at at this time? At this point in time, last year I was leading the point, so I wanted it to be back in that state, you know, in those footsteps, if not leading it in the top five. Mm -hmm. Jesus. Um, or, you know, my partner and I, it's not just I, it was my partner and I. Um, but, you know, it is fishing. So you, you, you can't, can't be but too disappointed. Yeah, there's some things we all like to think about after tournaments on them drives home of like, man, what could we have done better? And, Trust me, I've thought of it a hundred different times, and I know the. I know in some of the situations how to do better. So moving on this year, we're going to do better. And then on on the other side, to make sure you don't completely just wear yourself down, it's like you're you're still in striking distance, and so oh, it's yeah. not like it's not like one of those bottom outs where you see people like are always finishing a hundredth for like four or five tournaments. So. No, you're no, still you're there. Right. 
you're right. No, I, you're definitely right about that. And it's, it's not anything like I'm, oh man, I'm disappointed in the year. No, it's just not to, you know, we all set our goals. We all yeah. set our expectations and stuff like that. Um, I just haven't met where I want to be at this point in time in the year. And it's nothing, I'm not beating myself down. I'm not saying anything bad. You know, I'm not trying to discourage myself. It's just, you're learning. Mm-hmm. It's, all, it's been a learning process, even the bad ones. So I'm ready to just move forward through the rest of this year and just see what, what happens. So Ken Presley uh, just asked a question and for our podcast listeners, I will say it out. So how does Travis feel about the last couple of events? Does he feel like they can make up ground on the Potomac and the James? Ken, I'm assuming you're talking about the elite 70. <laughs> yeah. So um, I will, what do you think, Travis? <laughs> well, the next one's on Bugs Island, not Potomac for the elite seventies. Um, yeah, no, uh, I've actually moved recently, um, back in December. So I'm only about an hour and a half from Bugs Island. I've been down there almost every weekend for the past couple of weekends I've had off. Um, and I was at Gaston too. So Bugs is looking strong. Um, I, I was down there. What was it last? Not this past weekend, weekend before last one day helping out one of the uh, junior high school and high school kids. And, um, me and one of the juniors went out and fished for the day and had 1783 on my Rapala scale. So it was, it was, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. We, we, we could have had a monster bag that day, I believe. So, um, and I'm liking where it's going to heading into that two day event in a couple of weeks. Definitely am. It's looking like it's going to be a, a really good event. No, I think I think you got you have plenty of time to make it to, to, to make up ground, and I think you're going to still have a great opportunity to kind of hit hit your goals for the year. Oh um, yeah, well, our last one at the James, man. It's heck. Hope Landing's 20 minutes from my house. I'll oh, be that's, on that's a great location you moved to. Then that's awesome. Yeah, so I'll be on the water quite a bit, and I know Matt will be down here helping me out, trying to figure it out. So, um, speaking of the James, um, I. Based around that open event, honestly, the biggest thing I'd like to get into is more of like your game plan, honestly, like the strategy part of it. Um, is, is this is this the first time you fish like a tournament kind of like this for our audience at home? Uh, um, yeah, it was my first open ever. Okay. So what, and with the two days plus the extra, did you have, um, what was your strategy with the boating pressure, with the run? Like, did you have to, did you have all those factors going into the event in your mind playing with you about the strategy you were going to do? Um, so yeah, my, I had, I had multiple strategies run through my head. You know, do you make the run to the chick? Do you get in the chick and then, you know, just focus on the chick? Um, do I stay in the James, you know, do all that stuff? Do I go up in the James instead of down in the James, you know, just trying to figure out all those things to get away from a lot of that boat pressure. Uh, I ended up, I mean, I made a, a decent run. It wasn't, I didn't go to the chick. I stayed in the James. Um, but the area I found I did, I had it all to myself. So that was, I was very fortunate with that. Um, and not all of them. I had my second best area. There was quite a few boats in there. And one of the guys did very well that was in there. So the fish were definitely there. Um, what were the pros and cons of not going to the chick in your mind? Is it was just the time of the run? No, nah, the run didn't bother me whatsoever. It was more the fact of the past couple of events have been one down on the chick uh, that, you know, opens that have come to the James, you know, when you look back at history and all that stuff. And then when you go down there and you, you got people like I got a practice partner that rooms with me. He's from Massachusetts. A great guy. Um, he practiced in the chick one day and he looked at me and said, Travis, there's over a hundred some boats in the chick right now. And in my mind, I was like, that place is big enough for a hundred boats, but for this time of year, is it big enough for a hundred boats type deal? So you made the right decision. I mean, like I think Brian Schmidt was the, uh, I think it was Schmidt. That was the only one that actually was of the top 10 that actually made it. And he was the only one in, in the chick. So basically the chick yeah. didn't pan out. So you were right. And so it's interesting. I just want to always get your thought process that you made that chest move ahead of time, knowing like, 
I don't think this is going to pan out. So it's just interesting that you kind of knew. Oh, yeah. I figured you could go to the chick and crack a big bag one day. And people did. Mike and Ellie, I think, was one of them. Mm -hmm. You know, and I knew you could go to the chick and crack a good bag one day. I didn't think you could do it multiple days whatsoever. Not in this event, you know. Um, when you got a hundred some boats on the water for two days in a row, especially just the chick, and you never know that second day, some guys might not have went and other guys might have went just because they're trying to gamble at that point. Um, so my thoughts were the pads weren't up the greatest. So that eliminated a lot of water for a lot of guys. And so that can find a lot of water for a lot of guys too. So then you had just, I, from what I was told, I never went down there and saw it. From what I was told, you just had guys doing rotations and boats on top of each other all yeah. day. I, just like Potomac. I, I didn't want to deal with that. And when you also said like this time of year, is it because of the spawn? It's yeah. like this place just fishes completely different? Oh, yeah. No, they, they spawn in certain areas. You, where you catch them in the summertime or wintertime, you're not going to catch them so much in the spawn time. Is this the first time of year they've had it around the spawn like this? I feel like this is the earliest they've been to the James. Last. Because Brandon Polinick one, I thought was like more of a summertime deal. No, last year, they, it was only like a week or two after. It was like. Really? Okay. Yeah, April. I think it was like April 29th or something like that. It was the, later in April. Um, the difference was the fish were way past spawn. Mm-hmm. You know, they, it was it was in that third wave and beyond of the spawners in that event. We just hit it at a time period where they hadn't gotten through those stages. Like, and they hit it perfect. Don't get me wrong. Like, I wish we would have hit it four days prior. You know, like the weekend prior, because everything I was catching was pre-spawn. Like, just mm -hmm. looked like they had swallow, swallowed little balloons and stuff, just all pre-spawn and. I thought I had them figured out with the warming trend and the full moon because they had a full moon day three of the event and it went from 50 degrees on Monday to 80 degrees by first day of the event. Damn. And it's, you know, it was the perfect warming trend, perfect for them to get up on the beds. Um, and I thought I had them dialed in. I thought the area I had found was at the mouth of a backwater and I was catching them cranking, doing stuff like that at the mouth of this backwater. And I figured come tournament time, I could get in this backwater and start catching them off beds. And I think they were there. I truly do. Because day one, I pulled in there, had it all to myself. My first six or seven casts, I had a limit. It wasn't much. It was like eight pounds, but I had a limit. Um, and then day two, I went in there late to try to change the rotation up. And I caught a four and my co-angler caught a six in there. Damn. I just think my rotation was wrong for there. And I didn't fish slow enough on day one. Like, so did you, uh, I don't know how to phrase this. Did you, was your thought about only trying to catch pre-spawners? Was it spawners? And, and if it was spawners, like, is that different on a tidal fishery to target spawners? Are you looking for a, 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 a lowering tide or a rising tide? Like, or are you just blind casting? In general? Um, most of the time when you're looking at spawners, in my opinion, it doesn't, it does matter, but it doesn't matter. The male will bite no matter the tide. Some reason, I don't know if it's the Florida strain fish. I don't know if it's just me thinking crazy and other people have it all patterned different. But in my mind, it seems like it has to be a certain tide you get them big ones to bite. And I could be wrong, but I know day one I caught all bucks. And yes, I caught all bucks. I took them to weigh in. People could say, oh, well, the females just pulled up. No, I fished totally different area of the whole river, you know. Um, the second day I went in there and I got bigger bites hmm. and I changed my tide completely up. Interesting. Yes. So I don't know. I, 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 there were so many big ones in there in practice leading up to that event that I know they didn't all leave. I just think my tides were different in practice and I wasn't paying attention to my tides close enough. Our, I got our, okay, continue your thought. Continue your thought. I got Sorry. to thinking after the first day of the event, I was like, man, I'm pretty sure. Because when I pulled up there that morning, I was like, man, pretty sure there was a lot more water on this stuff when I was in here in practice. And then I got to thinking more throughout day one. I was like, maybe I should go back up there. 
And I didn't, for some reason, I didn't make the run back up there. And then day two, I went up there late in the day, and that's when I caught a four and my cow caught that six. And then I think we caught, I don't know, I think I caught a three, and then I cooled out almost everything I had right there. And then my cow angler cooled out pretty much everything he had right there. Damn. So in practice, were you going out and just low tide and trying to mark beds, or was it more of just a pre-spawn no, pattern that you, you were looking at? You can't see them. Um, I mean, there might be some areas on the place you can see them, but for the most part, you can't see them. So it was really just throw up. Sorry. Ken Presley asks, how did the tide affect what you wanted to do? And I, I, I think, Ken, that uh, Tra Travis was actually answering that. Yeah, um, it just affected. Um, we didn't have any strange tide. I just didn't run my tides right. You well, know. In a perfect world, how do you like to run your tides in a game plan? All depends on the time of year and in, in practice. You know, um, the perfect scenario would be the Elite 70s last year on the James. I had an area for low tide way down the river, ran all the way down there because it was going to be low down there first. Got down there, caught, I don't know, eight, nine pounds real quick off one spot, hit the next spot, caught a six pounder. Looked at the water, said, I'm done fishing here. Turn, ran, and ran to my next tide spot that I wanted on a lower tide. And fished, fished in there. I think I caught like a four and a half or five in there. And then left out of there. Had a spot I wanted for high tide back down the river a little bit. So I ran back down there, picked up Frog, and went to town. And Holy crap. <laughs> caught like two, or three, three, two pounders, three pounders. Left out of there, I had one more spot I wanted to hit right before weigh-ins and went up there, fired in there, caught a five-pounder and left. God, I don't know if that's a science or a freaking art form. Holy shit. Burned a lot of gas and ended up with 19 or something like that that day. God damn. That is... 20 pounds. And I, I literally... Um, and guys, I have a video coming out about this. Like, I finally got to fish the chick th two weekends ago. And I was like, holy shit, this is not the Potomac River. Like, the first time I saw it, like, just with the tide swings and stuff, it's like, it is insane. I can see why milk runs work there, because it's like, it it pulls. Oh, yeah. Go to the Rappahannock. Uh, yeah, that's... <laughs> that's a five to seven foot tide swing. Like, how did you... Is that just reps? That And when you say look at the water, is it just a gut feeling by this point where you know, like, okay, it's time oh. to move? You're just sitting there. Yeah, for the most part, you just got to understand where the tides move at certain times on the river. Well, you know, like certain areas, it starts coming in first and then it comes in other areas later. And you just got to, you know, you know, you fish the Potomac, you know, it comes in at Quiet usually before it comes mm -hmm. in. At Lutskin. So you just kind of run the areas, you know, and then practice determines whatever and then over years and repetition of fishing this stuff you kind of figure out what areas are better on what tides and some years they are different some years you might have to go back and hit that low tide area that was great last year on a high tide and all of a sudden it's phenomenal again um but really it was just i was running tides in the open too i mean i just the big ones never were there for me yeah, and then sometimes it's just kind of like how it is. Um, and it, it was really squirrely listening to the Japanese angler that wanted, like, he wanted, on a, again, a glide bait or a big bait too, which is, this is the year of freaking big baits. Like, it is insane how that's catching on. Yeah, well, Polynook won it last year, and that's kind of what showed it off because then in the BFL last year down there, it, the young man that won it had four fish for 21.15. It's, it, like, and I know this is a little off topic, but like as a student of the game, do you ever look at that and are you like, I need to learn this or am I just, am I going to do what, what's gotten me here? Well, here's my deal about it. I want to learn it just to have that in my back pocket if ever needed. Um, it's not for... I don't want to learn it because I just I want to be a big swim bait, glide bait guy. No, I want to learn it in case I ever do make it to the the big leagues and we go to Fork and I don't mm -hmm. want to go down there and everyone kicking my ass with a big swim bait, excuse my language, and I don't know how to use it type deal. Mm -hmm. um, but for here in Virginia, no, I, it's not something you need to go out and learn. It feels like it's a completely all or nothing thing. Like it if you're really, throwing down the James, you're either like never going to cash a check or one time you hit the lottery with it. Yep. 
my thing is it's just like spinner baits and chatter baits and all that stuff you know and shaky heads and that stuff it comes in it works excellent for a couple of years and then it kind of fades out it still works and it, you know some baits work better than others for over periods of time i think that's going to be one of those baits that once it's thrown 500 million times and i could be completely wrong and there's going to be guys sitting here like oh you're wrong blah 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 because they like throwing big swim baits and that's for them i'm by all means if you want to teach me and you know how to throw them call me i would love to learn but it's not something I'm going to go out there day in and day out and throw in tournaments. It's just not. So, so with, with that being said, like what, what tournament on the schedule, uh, rest your way? Like, are you really looking forward to and have like pinned to your calendar? Okay. I'm, I'm really looking forward to the two day elite seventies on bugs. I'll be honest about that. And the one on the James, but the one out of all of them, I'm really looking forward to is probably the upper Chesapeake Bay. Really? I've fished it a couple times now. I'm in love with the place. I might do the worst I've ever done in the tournament, but I'm at least going to go up there and have fun doing it just because it's tidal. It's shallow water fishing. It's what I like to do. It is such a weird place. I fish so many college tournaments up there, especially like the, like it depends on where you're going to go, but like the flats itself, like it is, it's like almost like Okeechobee esque because it's such a big bowl and it really is wind dependent too. And you got to find the juice. Oh, yeah. um, and you won't see my boat on those flights. That could either be a fantastic decision or the worst one. It's having uh, to be both ways. <laughs> it, you're not going to see it on the flats. I don't care. It's not going to be there. Uh, I, don't, I don't fish Chicken Muxkin. I don't fish Belmont. I don't fish any of that on Potomac. And I seem uh, to do half decent up there. So. You'll be the you're one, see me on the flats. You'll be the one guy loaded up like 18 pounds of smallmouth because that's happened too, which has been oh, is stupid when that I'm happens. Bet I'm gonna go up there and practice them too. Yeah, just be careful your lower unit because I did lose one there. Yeah, um, no, uh, yeah, driving a Yamaha now. It'd be all right. <laughs> <laughs> now, then you're also going to um, is it Oneida too? Yep, Oneida you're on the schedule in July. Now, how are you going to go up there for a week or how much practice are you going to try to get into that? My next. My, what is my event before that? I have the Bass Nation State Qualifier June 25th and 26th, something like that. I might leave right after that and get and practice from there until the 7th. Okay. Because, like, that's going to be – is that your first time fishing, like, northern smallmouth like that? Um, yeah, I mean, by myself, yeah. Um, okay. I mean, I'd probably – I'd done it some when I was a real little kid, you know, dragging tubes. I understand the concept of what to do up there. Um, but truthfully going northern smallmouth, yes, yes, definitely. I and mean, it's gonna be a lot of fun either way and be a really good experience to try to get. Oh yeah, definitely. No, like so I was actually born in Ohio and uh, Really? Yeah, and my dad and mom, we lived up there until I was like three, four years old. So my dad, his whole life, he was born same hospital I was. Or I was born same hospital he was, whatever you wanna say. But um, he was, you know, he grew up, raised, lived in Ohio until his mid twenties or whatever, and moved down here. So he understands it fairly well. And we've had our conversations about, you know, I've had my thoughts and he, don't get me wrong. He's not telling me what to go do. He's, I've had my thoughts and ideas of what to go look for. And I've bounced them off his head to see what, you know, he thinks about it since he understands it. And he, you know, he's told me yes or no on things. And, uh, the main thing he told me was it'll be fun for me because it's going to be right in my wheelhouse. So I'm excited for that. Um, I never expected a place like that to be kind of towards my wheelhouse, but if I get to pick up a spinning rod and look at them on a graph, I think it would be just fine. Yeah. It, it, there, it's fun and it, it's a different type of hard because we used to go up there for college a lot. And it's so weird that all the weights are so freaking tight and how it is you can have, a one ounce difference between like 20th and like the 10th. It's just, it's oh, weird. Yeah. Um, I'm hearing that it's still doing stuff like that. The lake is changing big time. Gobies. That's what I heard. It's like the yeah. gobies somehow got in there. The gobies are in there and they're getting big. So, I mean, you, you might catch your PR then easily. So that'll be freaking cool. It's going to be hard to get my, my PB up there. What's your PB? For smallmouth? Small yeah. Seven two. Holy shit. Where the hell Lake Anna? Clater. <laughs> Clater. Clater. 
damn, I heard about heard about Clater in a long time. What tournament were you fishing there? Were you fun fishing? I wasn't. I, I went to Radford. Oh, seriously? Yep. I can't believe I never asked you that question. That's freaking awesome. Yep, Clater. I had one bigger, I think, on the New River down there waiting one day, but that's uh, that's one of those lost fish stories. Oh God, yeah, we might have to get into that sometime. So, like, I'm that guys that really cut like wraps up like kind of his tournament. Um, I guess it, your your tournament season so far, and we're definitely going to have him on again to really just talk about more tournaments. We're going to kind of change topics here, but again, guys, let me know in the comment section below any questions that you'd like to have for Travis. Please also give him a follow. Uh, everything we talked about will be linked in the, the episode description. Uh, the next thing we're going to kind of get into is just kind of like the state of Lake Anna, uh, just kind of a quick little like report on, on Lake Anna's just health and where it is right now and, and where you think it's going. Oh, that place is the healthiest I've ever seen. it. Really? Oh, yeah. Give it. Mark my words, by next spring, you'll see one uh, one bag over 30. Dude, those are some bold words. OK, mark my words. What, what, what do you think changed or what's happening there that's making it better? I don't know. Look at the winter series weights. I think it, the heaviest weight it took broke the lake record with 2848 or something like that. God damn. Um, and then, and heck, that same tournament, 25 something, second place. Sure. Yeah. Imagine bringing in 25 something coming in second. God damn. Um, I was at that event. I had four for like 16. Is, yeah. is the is the bait is is the bait population in there the forage species are they healthy I think we had Ken on and he said like there was something going on with the threadfin and and the bluebacks um just the their population shifts like what are you seeing with the forage in the lake right now um I I'm seeing them do the same thing I've always seen them do you know but I've become one of those guys that mainly just fish for the herring fish you know I don't okay. I don't see much threadfin with what I'm doing um. The herring seem to be thriving in there. Uh, you know, in the gizzards, really, I do fish some areas that, you know, gizzards get into, and they seem to be doing the same as, if not better, than I've ever seen in there. Um, and the Florida strain bass are picking up. Because, yeah, didn't, didn't uh, the fishing game, didn't they actually just start stocking F1s in there? Or is it Florida strains too? F1s, yeah. Same F1s. One. Yeah, I mean, they're not the same fish. I just call them Florida strains. I mean, they, they're part, you know, they're not a full northern. Um, Yeah, no, they stocked, shoot, what was it? Heck, it might have been four years ago now, five years ago now. Ryan, I'm going to have to fact check that. We got Ryan McCarthy here saying a 32-pound bag was caught on Anna in March. Like, I'm going to have to make sure. I, I need evidence. I need a little link or something like that if a 32-pound bag came out of Lake Anna. To him. <laughs> I mean, we, we can talk backstage. Well, I'll show you the. <laughs> <laughs> but so, so yeah, the blueback. Um, oh, I know he's also talking about, yeah, no, the big bass tour uh, at Dustin put on. If you put in the guy's five total fish, it weighed like 32 something. Holy shit, really? Yeah, for the day. But they did it by hour. So technically, it wasn't the biggest five fish weighed in in a tournament. That's the way they're looking at it. Okay. Everywhere. Um, but yeah, no, I'm pretty sure their best five weighed like 32, 33 pounds in that when you added them up. That's uh, the idea that we could actually produce bags like that. Lake Anna is just fascinating to me, especially the size of the lake. Like if you said maybe at Smith mountain or, or, or Kerr or something like that. Okay. But like, it's it, that lake gets pounded so hard. Oh, yeah. The fact that you can pump out bags like that, it to me is insane. Oh yeah. Let's see. We do have a question here. Let's get this Travis one up here. Travis uh, Cyber, it may may be just me, but it seemed like the grass lines were coming up and in late later this year. Yeah, I kind of agree with that, bud. I, I know that. Agree with that. Um, how is the grass looking at Lake Anna? The shore grass is that? It's still coming up. But it's it's definitely been later this year. What? How is that going to affect like this summer? Um, let, me, let me extrapolate that thought out. With the grass coming in. Does that affect the shad spawn at all? Do the shad purposely, if there's more grass, will the shad actually spawn on that compared to the dock pilings? I think they're going to spawn on the dead grass. I mean, I don't think it really matters. I think they're going to spawn wherever they want to spawn, no matter what it is. Truthfully. I got that one. Um, yeah, truthfully, I mean, 
I've caught them on shared spawns on dead grass. I've caught them off shared spawns on live grass. I've caught them on shared spawns on dot post on and on points. You know, it's it, they're gonna just do it wherever they want to, really. In my opinion, I mean, I other people might think otherwise, but in my opinion, they're just gonna do it when they want to do it, wherever they want to do it. And now, being a blueback, like I know, like mentioning that you're not really i don't know if you focus on that or not but like when you are on a shad spawn like because that's the big thing that's going around now is talking about the shad spawn do you specifically go out there and you look for that are you looking for the shad to flick up or is it more of you're just fishing where you think they should be in practice and hoping for the best are you specifically looking for them? Oh, I'm, I'm looking for them i'm specifically trying to find the shad at that point um i will say with anna the shad spawn because of the different species of shad you're able to run a different shad spawn longer throughout the year than you could in other bodies of water in virginia what do you mean um well you got different species of shad they spawn at different times different water temps different whatever so it usually lets you prolong that shad spawn longer throughout the year because you can go after different species of shad throughout the year okay that that's interesting so now will you be game planning something like that going into these other tournaments like 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 the Kerr Lake without having to to give away the secrets? Is it something where there's like multiple plans of attack within a day or is it just going to be like one strategy? Um, With the time of year we're going to have, it's going to be a hodgepodge probably. Probably look for some shad spawn fish for morning time. Might go look for some because not all of them fish have spawned either. You might be able to find a couple good ones on beds. Wow. Um, I, I honestly think majority of the fish I caught the other week and we pre spawned. I looked like a couple, one or two post spawn fish. That's crazy. Um, and that time of year you should have the other ones up there spawning the old bluegills. So. Might throw a little bluegill spawn pattern in there too. Who knows? If you went to a random lake, how do you pick which ones you're specifically targeting? Is it just based on whichever ones the bass are following the most or whichever one's spawning the most? So if you have, you know, the shatter spawning, you got bluegill up on the beds, maybe there's a little bit of blue back in there. That seems like a ton of crap you have to mentally go through. Do you just go to your, you go to your comfort zone? All things being equal? At that point, yeah um your comfort zone because like my comfort zone is i like chasing herring in the morning so i'm comfortable doing that in the morning i'm gonna go to that in the morning um i'm i like fishing shallow like i'm I'm a shallow water guy i like doing that and when you're getting into these later months i like shallow because i'm away from boat pressure like boat like big boats and stuff um i don't have spot lock so you know, it's a little bit easier for me. It's not as many fish catches or you're, you don't have the possibility at that mega bag, but I'm going to go shallow. I'm going to go focus on like bluegill spawn, stuff like that. Then as a game plan, I can, you can, y'all can have that other stuff out there offshore with the herring as the day goes on. I love how you like want to be shallow, but you also talk about blue <laughs> blue package is your number one thing. And I always think of like 30 plus feet at Lake Hartwell, like fishing guts. It's just like that's Yeah. Well, see, I'm comfortable doing the 30 foot thing, but I want to do it in the morning when I don't have 20 foot, 30 foot big speed boats trying to come by me. Yeah, but that's going to serve you well, though, when you get to Oneida, too, like that, that, that blue back thought process. So when you get out in the ocean of Oneida, it's not going to be like this complete shock to your system. Oh, yeah, no, I'm prepared for that. I've done a lot of fishing at Hartwell where I'm out there in the abyss. So it it's freaking I, I don't know. I, I, I personally like blue back um, again, like fishing Lake Hartwell, Kiwi, Lake Murray for the college championships. It, it's different until you kind of like figure it out and then it can be absolutely just gangbusters. Oh, uh, it's, when, yeah, when it works out. Violin, it's so much fun. So we're going to guys, if you want to ask Travis a question, I want to have him on too much longer here. Please uh, put your comments in down below. Uh, the last thing, honestly, just to kind of wrap up today, uh, like what, what are some things that people can take away from fishing this time of year? Um, just give uh, top three baits that you think kids or, or anybody should have tied on when they go to the water. Um, let's see here. Let's go with the drop shot. You gotta have a drop shot no matter where you go because you can hook them weedless and you can hook them 
you know, a nose rig on the weed list for fishing deeper. Um, so a drop shot, just because that's going to be a bait you can do multiple things with. Um, Power then, shot or finesse? Finesse. We're going finesse here, shallow and deep, just because you got to have one finesse bait anymore in this world. <laughs> um, and then let's go with a, a buzz bait. I definitely have a buzz bait on the deck. Oh, damn. Okay. Yep. Definitely having a buzz bait on the deck. And the third one, that's, uh, that's a toss up. With what we're coming into right now, this time of year and everything, for kids and stuff, I would say have you a spinner bait or um, a Cinco, something like that for your kids. But for the avid angler, the weekend angler, I would also have instead of just a buzz bait, I'd have a frog. How do you how do you make the choice between a buzz bait and a frog? Is it just your gut, or there's is it specific things that you're looking for? Specific things I'm looking for as I go down the bank. And there you have it, guys, from the man himself. That uh, yeah, I definitely think the buzz bait was a little bit shocking. Like I did not expect you to say that. Oh no, I love me a good buzz bait. Like you think the bite is still, I, I clearly it is, but like when you have like the whopper plopper come in, I think that's what honestly the buzz bait, like those two kind of flipped out on each other. But I, I mean, honestly though, if you like to fish out, that kind of makes sense going, going with that buzz bait bite. I'm just so terrified of missing fish on it. Compared My to like thing is I can't skip a whopper plopper on your docks. This is true. <laughs> <laughs> so kind of have the buzz bait. James H, uh, not to change the subject, but have you seen any beds on the Potomac yet? I've been fishing the same couple acres of the Potomac two times a week for the past month and have not yet seen the beds. It really depends on where you're at. I know Jeremy Southerly, who won the BFL last week. We have him on the show next week. We have him scheduled. Uh, he apparently did see some beds on there and he caught some bed fish. I mean, that river is so big and, and Travis mentioned it with the, the James. Like, I think it's just where you're at. That's really going to dictate that. Um, they don't all spawn at the same time, especially when a place is that freaking big and long, uh, uh you know, the beach around Aquia is going to be different than DC. So it, oh. it really just, it depends on where you're at with that. Let's see, Travis cyber. You got another question here for, let's see, Travis, have you ever fished South Huddleston or Huston Holston? I can't fucking talk. Sorry <laughs> for the cussing. Uh, if so, how did you feel about it? Planning on making a trip down there? Well, I've never fished it before, so. <laughs> I have not fished it. That is my next destination I'm going to. Like I plan on in the next couple of weeks I have off, maybe taking a weekend and going down there. Um, I have fished like a moon mall and I've fished Clater and I've fished those other places, but not Holston. Does, does, um, Clater Lake and Moomaw fish a lot the same? Cause it's just a, it's just a river reservoir, right? In an end of its name. Um, nah, so, so they fish. So, so. The difference is in Clater, you still have a good pop of largemouth and spotted bass. So you can fish a little different there. Whereas move on, 90% of your population seems to be smallmouth. Oh, God, that sounds like so much fun. That's, oh, that's another they're place not, I really... They're not little. Really? Oh, your average is a two and a half, three pounder. Well, I think um, Woods and Water actually had an article they ran last year. Something. There's like a 20 plus pound bag that was like knotted out of there. Like that place is supposed to be awesome. like a hidden gem. Last February or whatever, it took four weekends in a row. You had to have over 24 to win. Holy shit. And it's all small. Now. One bag was like 26. Damn. Yeah. Holy crap. Now, this is all word of mouth. People telling yeah. me this stuff, you know, and these reliable sources, don't get me wrong. They fish move all a lot. Um, but I didn't see any results. They were just little club tournaments. I mean, move is not that big. So, but it's. If you've never fished for smallmouth and you want to go somewhere to go fish for smallmouth, go to Moomaw. You want to catch big rainbows and brown trout, and I believe it has lake trout in it too, go to Moomaw. Hmm. It's two, three hundred feet deep in areas. That's, wow. They got section of the lake that you can't go past the buoys because rock boulders fall off the cliffs. That's freaking insane. I've heard of uh, the trout fishing actually at the dam or at, at, at the tail race behind the dam. Like that's supposed to be like fantastic, but like that's 
uh, again, until I started this thing and started to do research, I didn't realize there's so many other cool places to fish. And then Clear Lake, my God, I used to vacation there as a kid. Like that place was so much freaking fun. I hope that like they stocked F1s. I think it was like starting last year. So I'm hoping that really juices that place up. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, I, I see I got a lot of buddies that live down there on the lake. And, you know, wintertime, you see a lot of 17 to 20 pound bags caught out of Clear. I'm assuming with live scope and stuff, that's also going to really help crank that number oh, up on some of these yeah. smallmouth places. Uh, if I remember right, like earlier this year, my buddy caught a uh, boy that lives down there caught like a five sixty something spotted bass out of there. Holy shit! Yeah, <laughs> well, it was one of the mean mouths, you know, not a true spot, but the Alabama bass they also call them. But shit, that's so freaking cool. Yeah, uh, it's it's got some studs in it. I'm going to have to make a trip down there at some point, but uh, let's see. We got guys. You want to get your questions in, please. You better hurry up. And then we got one more here. It looks like we got James H. What is the name of this smallmouth slash brown trout spot on Muma? So yeah, it's basically um, just the lake in of itself is what we're talking about. James H. Like there's everything in there. Uh, brown trout. I think rainbow. he's trying to spell it. It's like Muma. M O O M O W. Guys, in the comment section below, I'll, I'll actually put that in there because it's a weird name, but it's actually down 81. It is uh, in Covington, Virginia area. I'm going to put, and this is why you have four monitors for this. So, boom. All right. James H., I just, uh, I just texted in the comment section below the name of the lake. You can actually Google MapQuest that. I actually did a lake breakdown of that a while ago on a live stream. So, James, if you want to go there and do that, you could look at that as well um to make sure and travis honestly like you know thank you so much for coming on again um i want to give you the opportunity to kind of uh, talk about your sponsors and anything else you have coming up or anything in your social media feed that you'd like to to send people to oh yeah go check out travis luger fishing give me a good follow whatever um we're gonna uh, i believe thomas and i have talked about we're gonna start doing some video work of me out on the boat so that'll be good check him out with all that stuff um whenever we will get in touch with that Thomas and um, yeah, go follow Travis Luger fishing. Give me a like, follow whatever, and uh, check out MVP upholstery y'all um, check out my last post on Facebook on Travis Luger fishing. It shows my boat seats. Um, the dude does phenomenal work. Cause my seats, let me tell you, look like it's been through war and back and now they look unbelievable. Um, he also does carpet work and stuff. I got buddies that's gone down there and had, adjustments done on their boat covers and got stuff done a phenomenal work check him out um also check out crown battery if y'all need new batteries troll motor batteries i run group 31s in my boat um they're agm batteries and the ones i've had in my boat have i've not had an issue i mean i can go out daylight to dark and still have charge for the next day if i didn't get batteries on charge so go check them out as well um jake's bait and tackle Y'all know about Jake's Bait and Tackle. Go check them out. They're great people. Um, and Solar Bat Sunglasses. Y'all, I, I ride Solar Bat Sunglasses. I've used them for the past four or five years now. And so far, they've been, they've really helped my sight fishing game, honestly. These ones right here, they're the gradient Mossback green lenses or something like that. Um, they've, it, they, they're a very great product. Um, and have great customer service. Go check them out. And then guys, a link to everything that he talked about will be in the episode description. I'm going to be helping him out with his video editing. We're going to get this guy GoPro and then we're going to be able to pump that out on his channel. Um, so stay tuned for all that. And then hopefully at some point we're going to have Travis come on like in a monthly se segment where he can just, Travis can talk about whatever he wants and we're going to learn from him. Um, he's a fantastic angler and I really want to help really grow his his brand and his media reach. So hopefully we're going to figure that out in the, in the coming months so we can get in here and we can kind of learn from him. Uh, but please give him a follow. And then, yeah, guys, like this was the live stream. We'll be shutting this down soon, but please thank you. Like, and subscribe. The more we grow this, the more interviews we can do, the more we can bring awareness to everything in this, in this great state, in this great area, the DMV. And we'll see you guys next time on our next broadcast of fishing the DMV. See ya. You're listening ya. to fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.